What attracted me to ethnomusicology? I actually discovered the field of ethnomusicology while doing research for a project uh, in the course of my master's degree. And I was down in the, in the basement of the University of Denver Library and I found this journal called Ethnomusicology and it had articles about African drumming and you know all kinds of interesting things and I brought it to my professor Dean Mary Keim who was a musicologist and I said look what I found and she said that's it you should be an ethnomusicologist she said you know ethnomusicologists have one foot in musicology and one foot in anthropology and you should go to UCLA and so I said okay that sounds good and I applied to UCLA and I remember when I told my dad I and he said well where else did you apply I said that's it I want to go to UCLA and um, yeah it all worked out but there's a longer story and that is, uh, and I've written about this in, in um, certain of my writings here and there because I, I look at um, kind of music as a multicultural phenomenon in the United States among other projects. Um, and although I was brought up uh, you know, with, with piano lessons, I was privileged to, to take piano lessons and then to study at the New England Conservatory Preparatory School, charter member of the Baroque Ensemble, I played the cello, I had a very good um, high school music program, um, and uh, but I was also involved in musical theater, and I was also involved in popular music, and that led me really in college. Although I was a piano, uh, piano performance was my thing. It really led me more towards people's music and uh, getting out of that highly competitive, stressful practice room where you want to be better and faster and longer and more diligent uh, than other solo pianists to, um, you know, playing jazz and the Great American Songbook and singing. Um, so much more kind of gebrauscht Musik, you know, music for social use, spoke to me more in college. Um, and I think that led me more naturally towards ethnomusicology, which you know, looks at music among people, not just as a thing in and of itself. Um, I also believe that my parents, uh, you know, in spite of their best intentions to give me a good classical music education, uh, we lived on the south side of Chicago. It was in the, uh, you know, the crux of the civil rights movement when I was a young, uh, young girl before I was even 10 years old. We were listening to uh, the Midnight Special and the Weavers and Pete Seeger and Lead Belly, and I think that that kind of music of social justice sort of got in under my skin and stayed there until it was ready to uh, emerge again when, as it when I was a young adult. As I mentioned, uh, my advisor said you should apply to UCLA, so I did. And I went out there for a visit and I was accepted with a, a fellowship and then um, later on I got more, uh, more of a fellowship. I was supported by Jacob Javits and Title VI money, which then was for the study of strategic languages, so I studied Arabic. Um, LA was a wild world for me. I mean, I remember telling my grandmother back in Iowa that the only plant I recognized in Los Angeles was grass. It was tropical, it was desert, it was, um, you know, uh, it was a completely different environment. I'd grown up in Chicago and then outside of the Boston area and in New England. Um, and the diversity of LA was exciting uh, to me. And when um, I was attracted to two things, I mean, I was very much attracted to uh, the, the courses offered by uh, Ali Jihad Rassi and his ensemble, although I also played in some other ensembles. I really liked the Near East Ensemble. I had traveled to Egypt and Israel uh, before, uh, in the, before coming to graduate school, so that was a little bit in my ears. I had spent some time living in Greece and so forth, so kind of the, the Mediterranean Middle East was something that I was attracted to. But I was also really interested in this idea of the diversity of the United States and pushed back against the idea of going to a far, far away exotic land to discover people who wore interesting clothes and did exciting dances and ate, you know, um, foreign food and so forth. Um, my partner at the time was not an ethnomusicologist, so 
it really wasn't um, an option for me to sort of disappear into the mountains of uh, some faraway land for three or four years, which is what some of my colleagues, my classmates were doing. Um, so I wanted to do something that had to do with the exciting uh, dynamics of the American land, American landscape and American soundscape. So um, I, I ended up uh, in part by design and in part by chance uh, documenting the music of the Arab American community for my dissertation work. Yeah, so that first project, I did a, um, I did a paper for Dr. Rossi's class based on some albums that I had purchased at a garage sale, belly dance albums, and I was intrigued by the covers on these albums, and you know, uh, back in the day when you had an album, it was a full package, right? You had the music on the record, but then you had the album cover with the cover art, and all of the, uh, you know, the details of the, the, the make of the record and when it was done. And then you either flipped it over or opened it up and it was full of notes and contextualizing, uh, you know, the music, the names of the pieces, the musicians, and then just, you know, could be, a, you know, a few thousand words of description. And um, so I, I did a paper on that and then uh, for, a, for a seminar and then there was a grant proposal due. So I quickly adapted that paper for the grant proposal. And then people said, and I remember uh, uh, George Sawa, a wonderful canoon player from Toronto, he said, you know, you should do this. There's a, there's a real scene there, the Arab American musical scene. This is really interesting. You should do this. And so, you know, the paper led to a proposal, which led to a dissertation outline and field work in the, um, mostly on the East Coast of the United States, uh, where the scene that I was documenting was still happening. So I was able to interview musicians in their 80s who were busy professionals in the 1940s and 50s who were sort of the recording stars of the community and they painted for me a picture of an extremely dynamic music scene of Christian Arab, Christian Arab Americans who originally came from greater Syria so that was Syria before it was chopped up into Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, etc. And, um, and some of the tail end of that scene was still going on in the churches and in the supper clubs and nightclubs and so forth. Um, interestingly, the middle part of my career has taken a serious turn from that. And I'm, I think I'm more well known perhaps for my work among Indonesian reciters of the Quran and Islamic music in Indonesia. Um, my work there I think has been a bit of a myth buster because uh, I look at music and women and Islam all in the same title and it's, it, it all happens uh, together and I think that that pushes against some of the ideas about that we have about um, Islam and Islamic culture being centered in the Arab world or in the Turkish uh, Persianate, you know, Arab center of the Middle East, where you know Indonesia is the country with the largest Muslim population in the world. So of course it has a very correlative, large, and extremely diverse Islamic music culture which draws heavily on Arab musical aesthetics and the Arabic language. So it's an extremely interesting and important intersection of, you know, kind of a world musical system that is um, important uh, for the Islamic world, but also important for Southeast Asia, which has mostly been documented for its gamelan traditions and its traditions of courtly music and dance and so forth. Um, and I think as a, as a kind of story of women's empowerment, it's very exciting to hear about women with powerful voices, powerful, loud, virtuosic voices who are working in the business of religion, who are models for young men and adult men. I mean, who are not just women reciting for women in a women's style, in a woman's place, right? These are women who are public, who are reciting like men in this very same context where men recite. Um, it's not to say that the culture doesn't suffer from patriarchy, like we all do, um, but it, it's a, I think it's a very important uh, part of, of, that, of that world to, to bring to the fore.
because I perform Arab music, I have a, a Middle Eastern music ensemble that is, believe it or not, one of the first of the university ensembles, I think after Professor Rossi and after uh, University of California, Santa Barbara with Scott Marcus, I started my ensemble in 1994 and um, we've hosted you know, over 50 guest artists, so it's a real intersection of performers from diverse uh, traditions that come into our ensemble, that teach us repertoire, that talk about their music and their culture. Um, and so because of that, I've con continued to um, be involved in the Arab American scene, if you will, and uh, most recently have um, become more active in the refugee community in uh, the, the Tidewater area of Virginia, where I'm a professor at William and Mary. And, um, and that's been really interesting and gratifying for me to sort of use that ensemble, not just as a vehicle for teaching and, and research, but also for outreach, not just to give the university a different face and to invite different communities into, um, into the university, but also to use that ensemble to invite uh, our newest neighbors, uh, people from the refugee community, into um, onto campus and um, and you know into a little piece of Amer of America that they may not have suspected uh, uh, would be there. I think for students, um, and I t I teach mostly in an undergraduate world. I. I for us, music is part of the liberal arts, so I'm not in a conservatory setting where it's just students who are studying music who just want to, you know, click a box and do their one course in world music. So I'm really dealing with a very integrated curriculum, um, using music as one of a number of topics to um, open a window onto the world, right? So, um, and I think that for students who are going into any discipline, they can walk into one of my classes and learn about peoples and cultures of the world uh, in ways that they may not have expected. Um, and I see this particularly with um, you know, IR and government majors, and we have plenty of those, um, who can learn you know, as much uh, or more about, um, about the, the, you know, the wonderful diversity of the world uh, as well as how much we have in common. Um, why else? I think, I think being involved in different kinds of music making invites you, or different different ways that people make music invites you into music as a participant. Uh, even if you're, w whether you're a performer or an audience member, in ways that our music does not. And when I say our music, I'm referring to the kind of music education that we get as kids in school, band, orchestra, choir, music literacy, notation, practicing, practice rooms, competitions, marching band drills, um, those kinds of things. While these are all wonderful ways of making music, I've raised two kids, they all participated in those kinds of um, activities, I think you can you can teach and you can model in ethnomusicology a way of being social and musical uh, at the same time that are open and inviting in certain cases or in other cases that um, articulate other kinds of values and hierarchies that might exist in, in a culture. Um, and so I, th I think, yeah, I think ethnomusicology is important for, for all of those reasons and to just heighten our sensitivity to, uh, you know, to peoples and cultures of the world. And those peoples and cultures of the world might be sitting right next to you or just right across the room, right? Um, I th one, of, one of the big problems I think that we have in academia is, you know, the, the silos that we make with our departments or with our curriculum and our revised curriculum to say, here's the core and this peoples and cultures outside the Western world is this periphery that of course we're going to go there, but it's not the central mission. And I, I've been through a couple of curriculum revisions and uh, I don't think we are near an integrated whole uh, in that way. I think there's still this idea of a core and a periphery or we have to look out to this other thing that we're gonna 
you know, attached to our curriculum as an add-on or a satellite or something that's there for those kind of special students or those cool students or those DIY students or those alternative students um, or those orchestra refugees that have just had enough of playing in orchestra who want to go find something different. I would much rather flip it and have, you know, have our orchestra be that peripheral thing and, you know, fill the core with, uh, with the kinds of music that represent uh, the incredibly rich musical area that I live in. I mean, I live in the Tidewater of Virginia. We've got Appalachia on one side. We've got, you know, one of the most rich African-American musical legacies along the coastline. And then in the northern part of Virginia, we have one of the most international populations in the United States, right? I think that's what our, you know, our curriculum should look like. Um, it's not, it's definitely not that way, right? It is, you know, we uphold big, large, expensive ensembles like choir, like orchestra and band, and I am in awe of that. But taking a class in ethnomusicology or stepping into the Middle Eastern music ensemble or uh, the Indian music ensemble or the Brazilian music ensemble or the Appalachian music ensemble, uh, all offered at, at, uh, at William and Mary is a really important moment for for students and the audiences that uh, or the community members that benefit from performances or guest lectures or things like that.